The Lord took me back to a very old, familiar passage of Scripture. You, you almost don't even need to turn to it, but go to Psalms 23 and take a look at that for just a moment. And, and let's, let's contemplate uh, the Word of God. Can we stand like we always did? Let's act like the house is full and the balcony is overcrowded and we're just standing like the old potter's house. Amen. And we're going to read from the Word of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Oh, let me stop there. Ooh, something about that just made me so full. Just let me just say that again. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Oh, my cup runneth over. Surely. Ah, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Go back to the first verse. Because that's really what do my intention. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I want to talk from the subject, he speaks my language. He speaks my language. In the book, I talk about knowing the language of the opportunity that you're stepping into. It doesn't mean that they're not speaking English, but there's a different terminology in entertainment than there is in corporate America. And there's a different terminologies that are used in church than are used in the hood. Whatever arena that you're going in next, you can't bring your old language into the new environment. And I, and I teach you how to be bilingual enough to be broad enough that you're not isolated to one definition of yourself so that if they ever decide to move you, you are bilingual enough and ambidextrous enough to be versatile enough to survive the vicissitudes of life. In that articulation is also hidden the artifact of the ability to take abstract phrases and paint pictures in such graphic dimensions that without the benefit of a cast or a set that you can single-handedly mesmerize an audience by the articulation of speech and the ability to understand that your voice is an instrument, I do not want that to die out in our generation. Today we are talking not only about us honing our skills and our ability to be able to speak and enunciate in such a way that we are respected in any situation or circumstance because people respect you on the level of your articulation, often defining you by how you talk, making a decision while you are yet speaking because of the phraseology of how you made your presentation. I want you to know that this does not start 
with men, but it starts with a God who values speech and word. And today when I say he speaks my language, whether I am a pauper or a prince, he speaks my language. <laughs> whether I live in a mansion or a homeless shelter, he speaks my language. If I stay in the mansion, he is the king of kings. If I stay in the shelter, he was born in a manger. No matter where I am in life, our God is versatile enough to be the God of all people and not some people. No group of people has sequestered him. No denomination has been able to hold him hostage. No ethnicity can say he's ours and we say who's in or who's out. He's everybody's God, the Asians God, the Americans God, the Australians God, the Canadians God, the Africans God. He's everybody's God, the Nigerians God, the Congoans God. He's everybody's God, one God, versatile enough to turn his head from talking to you and talk to you and talk to you and talk to you. And, talk to you. and even when he was dying on the cross he switched from language to language to language while he was dying because your God is a speaking God he demands a speaking praise he is not satisfied for you to move your feet and not move your mouth. A speaking God wants a speaking praise the sacrifice of praise from the fruit of your lips good God Almighty <laughs> He speaks my language. In a jail cell, he speaks my language. He brings up Moses and Paul, and he himself was behind prison walls. He speaks my language. In a courtroom, he speaks my language because he is the judge of the world. In surgery, he speaks my language because he is the master physician. And in the wilderness with David, he speaks my language because David sees him not just as king of kings and lord of lords and prince of peace and powers and physicians and doctors and rocks that flow with water. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. Endow us with the grace of ministry. Saturate us with your spirit. Move in such a supernatural way that we will never be the same again. Allow us, oh God, to hear and be heard, to listen and to think and to reflect and to be mesmerized in your presence until we go through the metamorphosis of transition and walk out a little bit better than when we walked in, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, just before I quit praying, everything the devil threw on us, shake it off. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody give him your breast praise you got right now. You may be seated. I've been missing that man. I heard that in so long. Oh God, you don't know how long I waited to hear you say that. Say that again. Just say that. <laughs> That made my whole day. I have not heard that in 400 days. That's my dog whistle. That's like saying sick em to a pit bull. I needed to hear that sick em again. I can't get that through emojis. That's the power of speech. We cannot talk about speech without talking about thought because it is through our thoughts that we germinate speech. The mind is the only place we have left of assured privacy. The mind is the only place we have left of assured privacy. Think about that. We're never sure when we're talking, texting, emailing, or even bathing what drone or device may be eavesdropping on our most private or unfiltered moments. The only place that has not been decoded, hacked, 
and is 100% safe is your mind. It is the final frontier unexposed, unexplored by technology. No device has been able to decode what I think. That's why I refuse to allow anybody to tell me what to think about anything because it's all I have left is my thoughts. And if you enslave my thoughts by your opinion and make me acquiesce my thoughts just because you said so, then even though my body is free, I am still enslaved. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave. Thoughts liberate you. Thoughts empower you. And the way you grow once you are grown is not in your body, it's in your head. The moment words escape the sanctuary of your thoughts, from that moment, that split second forward, we risk scrutiny. Thoughts are spoken, and the moment they are spoken, they are scrutinized, misinterpreted, misapplicated. Yet words are the vehicles through which thoughts are conveyed. When my thoughts get ready to get in the car and drive, they drive through my words. And the more language I have, the more fluent my thoughts and emotions. The most frustrating thing is to be filled with emotions and limited with words. That's why people cuss you out. Because their vocabularies are limited. <laughs> and left with a limited vocabulary, they lack the agility of speech to be able to express how they feel, and they are reduced down to four-letter words because they don't know ten. So whenever you open your mouth to speak, it is your thoughts being driven out into the public air, and thereby you risk scrutiny, criticism, rejection, ostracization, or termination, depending on how well you articulate what you are feeling. And the most difficult thing to articulate are those things that are God-breathed into you, because they are so divine. The more you have linguistical reach, the more he can say through you. It's the difference between a stream and a river. <laughs> the flowing, the flowing of the thoughts of God, the flowing of the thoughts of God are so powerful, even in a man that God says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. Good, good. Think of that. The power of life and death is not in the fist. It's in the tongue. Do you hear what I'm saying to you today? When, when I started writing Don't Drop the Mic, it is in part because I realized that we have to keep talking. We have to keep talking. I started the book talking about Dr. Martin Luther King because he changed the world with a mic, not a gun. If you want to grab the most powerful thing in the world to bring about change, it is your mouth, not your fist. If you want to see a Mary saved or lost, it is always traced back to your mouth. The power of life and death is in your tongue. And if there's one thing that the enemy wants is your mouth that's where your power is, to speak against yourself, to curse yourself, to make declarations about yourself that limit yourself, that terminate the progress that is potential that is placed inside of yourself. God also wants your mouth, filling you with the Spirit because He knows that when He controls your tongue, your life submits to your speech. 
The Bible says in Psalms 45 and 1 that, the t- that my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. Caution though, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. Caution is the pen has no eraser. And since the pen has no eraser, there are some things you can say with your mouth that coming back later and saying, I apologize, really does not rectify the damage that has been done because I am always left wondering which one of you is really telling the truth. Maybe what you said is how you really feel and you're just trying to whitewash it. I don't know whether to believe the apology or what you said and that's why it's a weapon that has to be carefully used because language is very, very important. Think before you use it. Wait before you use it. I tell this joke many times, I don't know where Beverly is, but sometimes in the heat of anger, I'll write a letter and send it to her and then call her back that morning and say, have you sent that yet? Because <laughs> in the morning I calmed down and I had a different reflection on it. Even when pre- preparing a sermon, sometimes my first brush of the text isn't my final thought about the text and I'll say, wait a minute, let's, let's change the flow of that because words are so powerful. They are easily extracted, but difficult to be retracted. You have to be careful how you use those words. Even God, when God starts explaining himself, the first thing he tells you about himself is that he's a talking God. He's not just a sitting God like Buddha. He just doesn't sit on the mantelpiece and you can burn incense to him, to a speechless God. A God that cannot speak is not likely to be able to hear. He is a speaking God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Nothing changed until he opened his mouth. The moment he opened his mouth, everything started to be obey him. Let there be light. The Bible said the entrance of thy word giveth light. Whenever God speaks, he lights up whatever is dark. And the first thing God wanted you to know is that I can talk. So don't set me on your mantle and make me sit there like Buddha and don't carry me around in a case because you don't have to carry me. If you let me talk, I'll carry you. In the Gospel of St. John, in the beginning was, in the beginning was, in the beginning was, in the beginning was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Talking about Word, verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. That's Jesus. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Jesus is God talking and made flesh. His Word materialized. It's hinted in the book of Genesis when it says the voice of the Lord walked through the cool of the garden. It's the first hint that God has a Word that can walk. The walking Word is Jesus. The walking word is redemptive. The walking word is sanctification. The walking word is justification. The word walked through the garden. The word walked through the garden. And the word said, Adam, where art thou? Can I preach this text this morning? Glory to God. His word framed the heavens. Cast the stars into the sky, commanded the sun to burn, and made the earth to spin. His word hollowed out the mountains. His word dammed up the parameters of the sea and said, go here and no further. 
His word caused grass to come up out of dirt and corn yielding seed, each thing after his own kind. He did it not by fertilizers, shovels, and hoes. He did it by the power of his word. He wrote his word on the mountains of Sinai. He wrote his word on the walls of the temple in the book of Daniel. He scribbled in the dirt when the woman was caught in the act of adultery. I'm talking about God and I'm talking about word. In the book of Exodus, when he was fighting Pharaoh, it was God's mouth that he fought with. Pharaoh was had horses and chariots and soldiers and all God had was mouth. He turned to the lice because he speaks lice and said, go get Egypt. He spoke to the locust because he speaks the locust and said, go after him. God speaks. If you were to speak to lice, you wouldn't know the language. If you were to speak to frogs, you wouldn't know what to say. But God spoke the language of frogs until the frogs heard the word and started hopping toward Egypt. One day they woke him up out of sleep in the middle of the storm. They couldn't handle it because they didn't know what to say about it. And Jesus woke up and stood on the edge of the ship and spoke to the waters because he speaks water and said, peace, be still. And the wind lay prostrate in the floor and the water was slain because God Look at somebody say, he speaks my language. I don't care how high you are. I don't care how low you are. I don't care how black you are, how white you are, how brown you are, how intellectual you are, how illiterate you are. If God can talk to a frog, he can talk to you. God speaks my language from the word logos to the word rhema. He speaks both dimensionally. I want you to understand that logos is the general word of God. It's the, just the very general word of God itself that communicates his ability to do something or his general will on a matter. But rhema is the word of the Holy Spirit speaking to the specificity of your circumstance. The difference between logos and rhema is that logos is a suit you bought off the rack and rhema is a tailor-made suit that cuts in where you cut in and can't nobody wear it like you wear it because it was designed for you. The Holy Spirit quickens to a specific person for a specific situation. A specific person for a specific situation. He knows how to speak to that person for a specific situation. He knows how to speak to the king. The heart of the king is in my hand. I turn it any way I want to. I can speak to your boss. I can speak to the credit union. I can speak to the lending institution. I can speak to the committee. I can speak to the board because I'm God. I know how to wake them up in the middle of the night. I know how to give Pilot Herod a dream, Pilot a dream that unsettles him. I can handle your situation because I speak the language. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? And in all of that speaking, many times his truth is revealed without a word, without the usage of a word at all. His truth is revealed, never explained. Some of you are waiting for an explanation and you have been waiting for God to explain himself and real authority does not have to explain itself. It just is. My mama would say it this way. I say, why mama? She said, because I said so. <laughs> he reveals often without a word passed between us. Like the incarnate Christ, God is often revealed, not explained, 
not explored, not spoken. He has revealed. The word, the Greek word for revelation is apocalypse. It shouldn't strike danger in your heart. It literally means unveiling, like you unveil a painting to pull it up to expose it. You are blessed any time God lifts his skirt and shows himself. You are as blessed as, as Ruth is at the foot of Boaz. And the Bible says she was there under his skirts. Whenever God lifts his skirts, he reveals himself to whom he will reveal himself, how he will reveal himself, because he is God and he knows how to reveal himself to have the greatest impact on your life. That's why we can hear the same message and receive different things because to this one, he reveals it that way and to that one, he reveals it that way and to this one, he reveals it that way. And that's why every time you hear the message, you hear something you didn't hear before because you are getting a different point of view as he turns around and around and around. He reveals himself as you grow yourself to be able to handle what he would show of himself to you. Do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus didn't come to speak the word. He came to reveal the word. <laughs> if you think about it, let me take my time for a minute. I feel like preaching this morning. If you think about it from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have very few of Jesus' sermons. The Beatitudes, for the most part, is the biggest part of any notes of a message that Jesus ever preached. He did not come to speak the word, but to reveal the word. He revealed the word in such power that when they pierced him in the side, they didn't just see blood. He said the new covenant, the new testament, the contract is in every drop. It was not written. Jesus died without seeing the literal New Testament, but he bled it out. He bled it out. The new covenant that matters with God is not the New Testament you hold in your hand. It's the New Testament that came through the crown of thorns that was upon his brow and the 39 stripes on his back and where they pierced him in his left hand and his right hand and they brought his right foot and his left foot together, symbolic of the Jews and Gentiles being nailed by one truth. And there as he died, he revealed what could not be explained. In my text today, <laughs> you must understand that David is a very young man with limited experience, not, grown, not prone to wealth or notoriety. Your point of reference determines the way in which God reveals himself. <laughs> if you're a mason, he's a stone that the builders rejected. If your lips are parched, he is living water. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? That God has a multiplicity of ways of using your previous experiences as a point of reference to reveal himself. And David didn't have much. Just a poor pauper of a fella taking care of sheep for his father. And one day while he was out there taking care of the sheep, the Bible says that a lion crept out and snatched one of the sheep. And David said, not on my watch. And he took his slingshot and killed the lion without tearing the sheep. You don't understand that. That, that, that. that would be all, uh, very difficult to do. How do you land a rock in a, in a lion's head that kills the lion without tearing the sheep? And then several weeks later, perhaps, the bear came out and did the same thing. And David killed the bear without hurting the sheep. 
And God used that to lift his skirts. And he says, what I am to the sheep, the Lord is to me. He stopped the thing that would devour me. <laughs> every, every cancer survivor ought to be shouting. Every, every AIDS survivor ought to be shouting. Every person who's ever been in a car wreck and walked away ought to be shouting. Every person that it didn't look like you would make it and you're still here ought to be shouting. Everybody who was sick when they were a baby and they told your mama they didn't know whether you were going to make it and you grew to be grown, you ought to be shouting right now because God is so skillful that he can kill the lion. and save the child. And it is on the premise of David's point of view that God reveals himself in the language that David would understand. And we begin to realize that the Lord is my shepherd. You don't understand how powerful he is. David is the protector, acknowledging being protected. You have to be a protector to understand how powerful that is. Because when you are always the protector, people take you for granted as the protector. And they don't know how much it costs you to be the protector. And it is comforting to know when you are the protector that you are also protected. What I am to the sheep, the Lord is to me. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not face my destiny alone. And though I will face lions and tigers and bears, oh my, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, whenever I face them, I must not become so distracted by the lion, the tiger, and the bear that I forget that the Lord <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I'm trying not to dissect it like I want to dissect it because the other amazing thing about the text is that the shepherd would allow himself to be the personal possession of anybody is mind-boggling. He didn't say the Lord is the shepherd. He said the Lord is my shepherd. When you say something is my, this is my book. This is my towel. This is my glass of water. This is my iPad. It is ownership that God, who owns everything, would humble himself to allow himself to be owned by anything is mine, but the Lord is mine. <laughs> He is my shepherd whenever I need him, whenever I want him, even if the church is closed, even if the house is locked down, even if the prayer line is closed, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, I shall not. That's a commandment, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not want. Because of who my shepherd is, I shall not want. So forget intimidating me. Forget belittling me. Forget running up in my face telling me what I'm not. Forget trying to tell me that you are so much more than I am because I like nothing I need for what I was created to do. I shall not, y'all didn't hear what I was saying. I'm preaching way better than you shout. I'm preaching way better than you shout. I should, somebody holler, I shall not want. I refuse to want. 
I refuse to be desperate. I refuse to be pacing the floor at 3 o'clock in the morning. I refuse to be disheveled. I refuse to be unsettled. I refuse to be nervous. I refuse to be uncertain. I refuse to be insecure. I refuse to tremble at your gaze. I refuse to back out of a room God put me in. I refuse to give up a job because you don't like me. I refuse to let you write something about me that makes me walk away from being me. Ah! shall not well, write whatever you want to write, but I shall. Good God, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down oh, in green I don't have to search for my next opportunity. All I have to do is follow him. It is his job to find the green grass. It is not my job to say, I need some grass. I need some grass. I need some grass. Anybody seen any green grass? Where's the green grass? Where's the next job? Where's it now? He maketh me to lie down. He maketh me to lie down in abundance. To a sheep, green grass is prosperity. To sheep, green grass is abundance. He maketh me to lie down. Uh, he maketh me, Timberland, he maketh me to rest in what he gave me. He, he, he don't want me to be in green grass and insecure. How long will this last? He wants me to rest in what he gave me. I don't know, but that's somebody's word right there. God said it's not enough for me to put you in green pastures. I want you to rest and what I put you in. It bothers me that you won't lay down in the green pasture. I brought you in the green pasture. I moved you from here to there. I uprooted you to put you in a place where the grass was green and you still pacing the floor. Where you're still pacing the floor. You're still nervous. And the Holy Ghost said, lay down, lay down, lay down, lay down, lay down, lay down. Give up to where I placed you. Whoever word that is, let me hear it from you. Type it on the line. Make some noise. Put it in the tweet. I don't care how you put it out. God said lay down. God said lay down in the love. Lay down in the rest. Lay down in the peace. Lay down in the opportunity. Lay down. He maketh me to lay down in green pastures. I won't exhaust it all, but he leadeth me. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The still waters. You, you have to understand that rapid water is dangerous for sheep because they are heavy laden with wool. If you try to cross the sheep to drink from rapid flowing water, they'll fall in and the weight of their wool will pull them down and they will drown. But God is so sensitive to how much I have on me. <laughs> oh God, you don't hear what I'm saying. God is so sensitive to how much I've been carrying on me, how much I got to deal with, how much I got on my back, that God won't let me drink for waters that are too fast for me. And at this stage, I pray like this, Lord, I don't want anything you don't want me to have. I don't want a job you don't want me to have. I don't want a friend you don't want me to have. I don't want a companion you don't want me to have. You know how much I got on me. He leadeth me.
He leadeth me. He leadeth me beside still waters. I rebuke the spirit of envy. I rebuke the spirit of jealousy. What one person can stand, another person can't stand. You got too much wool on you to wish you were somebody else. Stop trying to be somebody else. God's already weighed you. He knows what you can handle. He knows what you can stand. He knows where your limits are. He knows what will give you a nervous breakdown. If God puts you in still water, be happy and drink from the waters he put you in because God has already weighed your capacity. He leadeth me beside what I can handle. <laughs> Somebody holler, I can handle this. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He is to me what I am to the sheep. He is as careful for me as I am careful for that which I love. God speaks my language. He, now the God who stepped out on nothing and said, let there be something, is speaking to David in shepherd talk. <laughs> I never will forget one day my mama called me. I picked up the phone and I said, hello? My mama said, Jesus is God. And I thought, what do you mean? And then she said, with no Bible, no scripture, no text, she said, I was cooking eggs this morning. And she said, I cracked the egg. And I looked at the egg. And I saw that the egg had three parts. It had a shell. <laughs> it had a yolk. And it had a white. And still it was one egg. And all of a sudden I figured out, I saw Jesus in an egg. God speaks your language. God knows how to show himself. God knows how to reveal himself. God knows how to show up in your life. God is going to use everything you ever learn to reveal himself. It is not just about books and Bibles. It is about having your eyes open, the eyes of your understanding enlightened that you might see him. The Bible said that the heavens are telling the glory of God. Nature is telling the glory of God. The wind is telling the glory of God. The eagles teach us about the glory of God. As the eagle stirs her nest, so is God. God speaks your language. Language. He restoreth my soul. Good God of mercy. The only reason we survive grief the only reason we don't lose our minds the only reason we don't cry till we die it said someday, and you never know which day it is, you just keep on walking in pain, and one day, you said, no, Bokosha. <laughs> one day, you walk into restoration, and it's not that you don't still love him, and it's not that you don't still miss him, but all of a sudden, he restored your soul. You don't know what time it was. You don't know what day it was. You don't know where it was, but he just restored your soul, and you start to feel like, I think I'm going to be okay. I think I'm going to be okay. Medicine couldn't do it. Doctors couldn't do it. Surgery couldn't do it. Flowers couldn't do it. Candy couldn't do it. Nice words couldn't do it. Holy God! He restores my soul and my cup runneth over. Come here, Cole. This is my cup running over. My cup runs over so that anything around me, if you just 
get around me. Whether we talk or not, there's a certain level of anointing that will fall on you. I'm not saying you don't know God for yourself. I'm not saying God didn't call you for yourself, but there's a certain overflow that just runs over on top of you. Hey, and you find yourself blowing in something you don't even understand. That's why you got to get around somebody that's got more than enough that if you get close, if you touch, it'll fall on you. If any two of you agree as touching anything, God gave me more than I could handle. If I just had enough for me, I wouldn't have time for you. I can't be bothered with you because helping you would deplete me. But because my cup is running over, you can catch the overflow and I can still be full. And we can preach, come on back to back. Get back to, we can preach back to back and neither one of us will run out because there's enough power to jet fuel everything that's in you and everything that's in me. My cup, thank you, babe, my cup runneth over. 30 seconds of crazy praise. I said crazy praise. I said run it over praise. I said run it over praise. Let it run over. Let it run over. Let it run over. I feel a running over in your house, on your friends, on your spiritual sons, on your daughters. I feel it overflow. Let it run. I dare you to praise him till your cup runs over. I dare you to praise him till you drown your devil. I dare you. Yes, yes, yes. Look at your neighbor and say, if you praise him again, I'll praise him again. <laughs> it's running over. My joy is running over. My peace is running over. My anointing is running over. My wisdom is running over. My gifts are running over. Catch it, 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 catch it. Catch this, catch this, catch, catch, catch this. Stand on your feet. David knew to teach him what he didn't know. He speaks my language. I've always been fascinated how in the middle of this beautiful dissertation, there is a huge deviation. He goes from my cup running it over and talking about being led and being blessed and the paths of righteousness to yea though I walk Yay. through the valley of the shadow of death. And I never un fully understood how that fit with the previous sins because I'm not a shepherd boy. But I was reading about shepherd boys who live and herd their sheep in the wilderness. I did not realize 
the convicts in David's day, men who were on the run, hid in the wilderness. And they were hunted, but they were hiding. But if they could find a shepherd's tent, <laughs> the shepherd would take them in and feed them. And all of a sudden, though they had walked through the valley of the shadow of death, if they could find a shepherd in the wilderness, <laughs> <laughs> Though they were guilty and pursued for persecution, if you could find a shepherd in the wilderness. <laughs> and I, 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 I know it's some guilty folks in this room. I know it's some guilty folks watching us online. I know, I know, I know, but if you can... Find a shepherd. Though you have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear any evil. Because the shepherd is both a fighter and a protector. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. The rod beats away the wolf. The staff reels in the sheep. He prepares a table for me in the presence. Of my enemies. Jan, there ain't no meal. Excuse my English. But there ain't no meal like the meal you eat in the presence. <laughs> of your enemies. When God lays out a five course meal in front of folk who said you would never be nothing and you would never go anywhere and you would never be anybody. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And if you are a sheep, don't worry about it. He anoints your head with oil. Now, I know that's a little messy. Oil all in your wool. But sheep have a way of sticking their nose in holes. And snakes have a way of hiding in holes. But if the sheep has oil on his nose, it's a snake repellent. When I think of the things that I have stuck my nose in, Maybe y'all don't relate to it, but I have stuck my nose in some stuff that I know should have killed me. But thou anointest my head with oil. I leave you with this word, surely. Do y'all hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? Do you receive this one word? This word, surely. Virus or not, job or not, career or not, wife or not, husband or not, friend or not, if you take everything else away from me, you cannot take away my surely. David will me a surely. 
as surely as in my belly, as surely as in my spirit, as surely as in my mind. I may have lost my car, but I haven't lost my surely, 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 goodness. And, and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I, when it's all over, I mean when it's all over, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Woo! I feel a gully washing anointing. Yes, I, 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 I feel a gully washing anointing falling right on you right now. As that surely rises up in your spirit, is pushing out everything you've been worried about, everything you've been upset about, everything you've been intimidated about, everything that tried to kill your joy, kill your peace, kill your comfort. God said, surely, 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 surely. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? God gave you a surely. Goodness, 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 and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I know you've been through some storms and rain, and I know you've been through enough stuff that should have killed you, and I know you've been through enough stuff to have been a drug addict, to have lost your mind, to have blown your brains out, but you know why you survived? Goodness and mercy. Look back over your life. Goodness and mercy. Look back over your storm. Goodness and mercy. Look back over your collapse, your disasters, your surgeries, your storms. Goodness and mercy have followed you. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Every abused wife needs to holler. Every victim of domestic violence needs to holler. Every victim of discrimination needs to holler. Every kid who ever had to fight your way home. Everyone that's ever been betrayed ought to shout. Surely! Devil, did you hear what I said? Devil, do you hear? Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you hear what I say? Do you hear what I Goodness. Goodness and mercy. It's going to follow me. It's going to follow me. It's going to follow me. It's following me. It's going to follow me. It's following me. When I move to Dallas. It's following me. When I move to Texas. It, it's following me. When I pulled up everything I had and left. It's it, following me. Goodness and mercy has followed me. It's following me. I was young. It's now I'm old. Now I'm old, and I've never it's seen the righteous forsaken, nor the seed begging bread. It followed me. It followed me. I lost my mama. You lost your mama. We went through storms. We went through trials. But 
Jolie! Good massacre! We are still here! I want you to sing it on the couch. It's following me. I want you to sing it in your kitchen. It's following me. I want you to sit right there in that chair and say it's following me. I want you to sit in your car and say it's following me. It's following me. Who is that? Who? Who? It's following me. I'm gonna be all right. I'm gonna be all right. I'm gonna be all right. Because it's following me. Tell cancer, it's following me. It's following me. I know it's simple, but the Lord gave me Psalms 23 and 1. And he said he speaks your language. He's going to pull his skirts up and reveal things that cannot be explained. And he's going to speak it in a language that you, don't, you won't miss it. He is your shepherd. You shall not want. And I, it's practically a Sunday school scripture. Psalms 23 and 1, but it's following me. I've been through a tough year, but it's... Every time I move, it moves. Every time I stand, it stands. Every time I wait, it waits. Every time I take flight, it flies. Psalms 23 and 1 guarantees me that it might get rough in the middle. <laughs> I might have to hide in the tent. I might have to have oil on my nose. But when it's all over, it's it's going to follow me. <laughs> Honey, I want to sow into this word just a simple seed. $231 for Psalms 23 and 1. I want to sow into this word because there's something I'm getting ready to break open in our personal life, in, 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 our, in our life, in our business life. And, and this word, while I was preaching, it's following me. I'm getting ready to lose something. With 231, just symbolic of, I set myself in agreement that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And those of you that can, you can follow us. Or if you just want to sow 23, symbolic of, this is my word, this is my moment, this is my time. This is my space. It's following me. All of the days of my life. It's been following, it's following me. me. Even when I wasn't right, it still followed. All of the days of my life. When I was fearful, it it's followed me. me. I got tired, but it followed me. I got a little weak, but it's I was lonely, but it followed me. I got tired, but it followed me. I made mistakes, but it followed me. 
It followed me. It's following me. It followed me. It's still there. It's following me. It's still there. You still got it. It's following You're me. You're 60 and it got it. You're it's following 71 me. years old and you got it. It's following me. You're 82 years old and you got it. You're 30 years old. You're living with your mama, but it's... <laughs> you got school debt all over your head, but it's... Your car don't have work, but... It's following me. You got a child that act like they don't like you, but... It's following me. Psalms 23 and 1 says it's following me. It's following me. It's following me. Just before I close, the anointing is in this place. I don't know if you feel it like I feel it. It's following me. But I've been predestined. It's following me. I've been predetermined. It's following me. I've been called. I've been set aside. He first told me about it. I was 17 years old. And I thought, Lord, I'm too young. I can't do that. Now I'm almost 64. And all the days of my life has been it followed me through my 20s. Yes, sir. It was following me. It's following me. I started my first church in my 20s and it was following me. It was following me. It's following me. I was 24 years old when I married her and it followed me. It's following me. Yes, it did. It just followed me. I lost my job, but it, it followed me. It's following me. They repossessed my car, but it followed me. It's following me. They said I'd never be a preacher, but it followed me. It's following me. They made fun about how I hold my head up and walk with it's my back straight, me. but it followed me. Following my mama was frying chicken in the back behind the wall to help us pay the rent, but it was following it's me. Following me. Sometimes I didn't even have gas money to get back home, but it was following me. I preached all over West Virginia to 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 people, but it was following me. I climbed over the Appalachian Mountains and started going into Pennsylvania and Ohio, and it was following me. I went to New York for the first time. I was scared to death, and it was following me. I got invited to London, had never been that far away from home, but when the plane landed and I got my baggage, it was following me. I flew down into Africa, had never been there before, landed in Ghana for the first time in my life. My mouth was hanging open. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. But I looked over my shoulder, and guess who came with me? It's been following me all my life. And I guarantee you, 231 saw it funny. I want to saw it, because if it followed me for 64, I figure it'll follow me the rest of the way on home. 64 more. What's wrong with it? Ain't nothing wrong with it. It's following me. Yeah, it's following you. I want you to claim it for you. Say it, everybody. It's following me. It's following me. Say it again. Say it like you mean it. Say it's it like hell is me. Say it again. Say it like you mean it. Like you really mean it. It's following, it's following me. me. You watch it out there on television. I don't it's care if you're out of tune. I want you to lift your voice and just sing it one time. It's, it's following me. Oh, God. If there is by chance 
one person in the room who does not know Jesus. Please don't let this service close without coming to know the shepherd. The shepherd is so good that he can kill your lion and you not have a scar. He can knock down your bear and you walk away clean. It will protect the protector. If you accept him in your life, he will cause goodness and mercy to follow you. It won't be that you don't go through some tests or trials, some storms or winds. It won't be that you're not hunted in the wilderness, but he'll always bring you to the table and feed you just in time. And when the wolf comes, he got a stick for his head. And when you get too far out the wheel, he got a rod that'll pull you back in. I'd like to pray with you to know Jesus. Father, right now, every heart that's open and every mind that's open to receive your spirit, I pray that they will come to know you in the free pardon of their sins, that they would confess the Lord Jesus right now. Just simply with your head bowed, say, I confess the Lord Jesus as being Lord of my life, and I make him my shepherd, not their shepherd. I was watching them, but now I'm going to join in. I want him to be my shepherd, take over my life. Kill my bear. Destroy my life, because I'm going to walk with you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus. Backslider, here it is for you. God, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know how I got so far out the wheel, but I feel your hook in my neck. Your staff is pulling me back home. And right now, here I come. I'm smelly, but here I come. I'm bruised and bloody, but here I come. I've been in some fights, I got some scars, but here I come. I'm coming home right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. All over the building, all over the world, give him praise everywhere. Come on, give him praise. Somebody give Cora that mic. Somebody give Cora that mic. Get a microphone for Cora. I want her to close me out. Come on, give, give, give. give. Oh, you, you give up so easy. Come on. believe in your glory we believe that you are following us your goodness and mercy is following us you are speaking to us so I pray God in the name of Jesus that you release your voice release your voice to every person under the sound of my voice God release your glory release your anointing release your power release your presence have your way God in a supernatural way don't let us move into this week the same way we moved into the weeks before have your way in our lives, in our minds, in our spirit, in our body, God, that we don't just take your language, but we speak your language, God. Yes, God. We begin to speak to you. You begin to speak to us. Yes. Connect us and unite us, God, for such a time as this. Spirit of the living God, help us to receive the overflow. Help us to receive the overflow. Help us, God, to receive the overflow that you're pouring out in our life. And I thank you for healing. I thank you for deliverance. I thank you for breakthrough. I thank you for following us. Give God glory. Everyone who is under the sound of my voice, lift up the name of Jesus, for we believe it is so, and so it is. Amen.